There we go. All right, the terms of the covenant. All right, we are, we are at a very important juncture because we begin now to get into some of the specific instructions. What I want you to see and hear this morning is that which lies at the core, the very heart, the very root of the instruction that God has given us. We've already talked about the fact that God is giving us these instructions for our own good. It is for our good that he instructs us. It's because he loves us that he gives us this instruction. And as we look at the terms of the covenant, we began to see several covenants here. There was the original Abrahamic covenant, which was, we said, a covenant that was made by God that was a one-sided covenant. In other words, he said, I am promising you this. This is my promise of God, and it doesn't matter what the people do, that covenant is still going to be fulfilled, and that was for the land to be given to the Jewish people. Then we saw in the Mosaic Covenant, which is what we're in now, that it is a two-sided covenant. He says, if you will do this, then I will do this. And that is more of what we call a contract, contractual covenant, two-sided covenant. If you do this, then I will do that. And in this covenant, he is laying out specific guidelines for a healthy physical and spiritual life. And he's giving us these things so that we might be blessed, encouraged, strengthened, and strengthened in our work with him. So today we come to three very important points in this Decalogue. We're going to look at adultery, stealing, and lying. Now the the reason I want to put these on the front end today is because while you might be sitting there kind of sorting that in your own mind, well, let's see which one of these is the worst and which one of these is not so bad. God doesn't seem to do that. In fact, he gives us these things, and I'm putting them out here before you in one lump sum to say all of these problems, adultery, stealing, and lying, are all rooted in the same problem. They're all rooted in the same issue of our fallenness. What is that issue? I've already prayed it this morning. And that, that is that if, we, if we're not attentive to those things in our spirit, it's because it's all about us. It's what I want in the moment. In the passion of the moment, what do I want? I lie because I want to make myself look better. Or I want to achieve something. I want to get something. I steal because I'm selfish. I want something I don't want to earn. I have adultery, not, listen, never because of love. I know that's controversial in our culture today. It's not because of love. It's because of selfishness. It's rooted in selfishness. So here here we are today looking at these things. And he is saying that if you will... Focus and make your life about that which is glorifying to God. Then your life is going to be fulfilled. You're going to have a fulfilled nature. You're going to have a fulfilled spirit. Your life is going to be good. You're going to enjoy life more. There's not going to be this treacherous boundary between you and a holy God. You can come to Him freely, openly, boldly, right into the throne of grace. As we've said the last several weeks, the veil's been rent. It's open wide. You can come right to the throne, and you don't have to fear. And when we come into that throne with, a, with these things being attended to in our life, then we have become more, and we are becoming more than what we were the day we were saved. It's called sanctification. We are being sanctified. And we're coming into his presence without the fear of any of those things. That is for our good. Do you want to come before a holy God in fear? I think not. We want to come before a holy God with a, with a wonderful spirit and an enjoyment of him. The chief end of man is, the chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. And to enjoy him forever. Amen. Amen. 
See, we only had amens on the front row up here. This is, and to enjoy him forever. Amen. All right, that's a little better. That's, that's the Baptist way of doing things, isn't it? <laughs> All right, well, so what is the covenant? We just talked about that agreement defining our relationship. This whole thing is about our proper relationship with God. If we have a proper relationship with God, it is because we are acknowledging him for who he is, and we're holding him up high for who he is, and we're recognizing who we are as fallen creatures. That he, he is pure and holy and righteous, and he comes before us giving these, us these guidelines saying, this is what it is to live a holy life, understanding, as we've already said, that none of us keep all of the commandments. But he says, even if you have fallen at one of these, you have failed at all. In fact, we've been looking at the fact of how Jesus treated this when he preached from the, the Sermon on the Mount, beginning in Matthew chapter 5, when he says, adultery? You even look at another woman with lust in your heart. You have committed adultery, gentlemen. So none of, us, none of us stand above these. He just saying that this is what it is to have a proper relationship with God. And he says, these things will make you happy in life. You will have an enjoyment in life. How does he begin the Sermon on the Mount? With the Beatitudes. Be happy. If you want to be happy, here's what you do. You want to be happy, here's what you do. You want to be happy? The Beatitudes. Blessed are. Blessed are, blessed are. These are the happiness quotients. Let's look at Matthew 22, 35. He says, one of them, a lawyer, this is an exchange between a lawyer and Jesus. He says, one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment of the law? Now, we've already looked at this text several times, but I want you to see the context of this. As we've already talked about this morning, the context is really important. He's being challenged by a lawyer. And he's saying, which is the greatest of these commandments? We've talked about all of these commandments. Now, which is the greatest? And he groups them in exactly the way we've talked about the last several weeks. The first six have to do with a relationship with God. Exactly right. The, la the, the first four, the last six have to do with our relationship with one another. We've already looked at one of those. We're going to look at, an, at several of those again this morning. But this is the law. So he says to him, he groups them in, the, in this order, and he says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and your soul and your mind and your neighbor as yourself. Therein lies the wholeness of the law. So he tells him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole of the law and the prophets. Now, what do we say about the law and the prophets? The, when, when anybody spoke biblically about the law and the prophets, the, the law was those first uh, books of the Old Testament. That was the law. The rest of it was the prophets. So he's talking about all of the Old Testament. He says all of the instruction we have in the Old Testament is rooted right here. This is, this is what we're talking about. Romans 13, 8, here's Paul, owing nothing to anyone except to love one another. Now, I said all of these problems were rooted in this one problem of selfishness. Now Paul's going to talk about the, 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 what resolves that selfishness. What is it? It's love. It is this biblical, agape, God-like love that resolves the selfishness issue. And yet... We want to make something so difficult. We talked about being simple this morning. Here's the simplicity of this, and yet how hard it is to achieve in our own lives because of our own fallenness. But he says love is the core of all the resolve of these things. A proper love for God and a proper love for one another. And so we talk about adultery and stealing and lying. It's rooted in a lack of a proper love for one another. Herein lies the problem. So we're going to talk about this love this morning. We've already talked about it over the last little while. This is a love that is unselfish. It is totally a giving love that says, I will give to you, just like the Abrahamic covenant, I'm going to give you this regardless of what you do. I love you. It's like what my wife and I say to each other often, anyway. You know, I love you anyway. 
This is the, this is the love of God. He looks at us, and I'm so thankful, aren't you? You don't have to earn the love of God. He looks at you and he says, by the blood of my son who paid the price for those sins, I love you anyway. That's the way he is instructing us to love one another, is in the same kind of love. It's rooted there. For this you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, nor, nor shall you covet anything that belongs to your neighbor. This commandment is summed up by saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I don't steal from my neighbor. I don't have adultery with his wife. I don't do these things because of love. Yes. Yes. This is, this is the core of the whole nature of this. You want to get back to the core of what the Ten Commandments are? All the thou shall nots? Let me ask you a question. All of them are thou shall not. So negative, pastor. So negative. <laughs> thou shall not. Thou shall not. Well, let me ask you this. How many thou ought tos are within one thou shall not? There's a whole lot of oughts in a thou shalt not. It's a simple way of putting what the nature of our being should be in Christ. And there's... Thou shalt not steal. There's a whole lot of ought to's behind that. We're going to discover some of those this morning. Love does, not, does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Have we heard that yet? Have we taken that in yet? Are we living that yet? Love is the fulfillment of the law. Here is... Where it stands, here's where the very foundation of these commandments are rooted, is in our proper love for one another. God chooses to love us. We're not very lovable. But he chooses to love us. And then he says, that's the way I want you to love one another. But, but pastor, that person's not very lovable. <laughs> Love one another. It is a caring, giving, spiritually powered love that allows me to love some people. I've prayed for that. I've longed for that. I hurt in the midst of that. Let me say that's true. You will hurt in the midst of that. And yet we ought to be praying for that anyway. That is what the very nature of it is. So this third covenant or this uh, part three of the covenant is rooted totally in love. Let's review real quickly. No other gods but me. No idols or images. We talked a lot about some, what some of those things might be. No misuse of the name of Yahweh the Lord, uh, observe the Sabbath day, keep it holy. We saw that Jesus is the fulfillment of that. Honor your father and mother, we looked at last week. No murder, we looked at that last week. And then this week we start with no adultery. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Now, what is, what is the reason for this, do you think? Let, let's just talk about the reasoning behind this. This whole marriage ritual that were given by God, he says, God says, is a picture of Christ and the church. And our faithfulness as the bride of the bridegroom who has come, our faithfulness of him is to be reflected in our relationship with our husband and wife. And love does no wrong. Love honors, love trusts, love forgives, love doesn't have a need beyond the one that God's given us to love. And he says, I've given you my son to love, and your marriage is the very picture of that. Now that's what the Bible says. I know that's not a very popular message today. But that's, I believe, one of the great reasons behind this. It is the picture of Christ, the bridegroom, 
and the church his bride. We are his bride. And we are to be faithful to him. And to him only will I serve. And to him only will I give praise and worth and honor and glory. To him only will I do that. Why? Because he is the bridegroom. We are his bride. And what we do in our marriages, what we do in our relationships with one another is either proper or it's improper. And that's that's saying before a lost and dying world, this is what I think of my God. This is my, what my relationship is like with my God. So is it important? You bet. And it's all rooted in this love issue. I've had, I can't tell you how many men and women together that I've counseled over the years that have come into my office and said, well, I've, I had this relationship, let's say, with this woman. And I just believe God told me to do that. Okay. Wrong. Wrong. God will never speak to you personally what is in conflict with his word. Wrong. You must not steal. Well, let's look at a couple of verses here from Ephesians. I, I love the book of Ephesians. I particularly love chapter 4. Verse 28 says, If you are a thief... Quit stealing. Is that simple enough? (laughs) You're a thief? Quit stealing. Instead, he says, there's a way to properly use your hands. All of this, again, is about proper relationships as opposed to perverted relationships. It's about a proper understanding of who God is in relationship to us and the gift he's given us in one another. Listen, you are a gift to me. I pray that I be a gift to you. This relationship is one to be honored. And he says, instead, use your hands for good hard work, then give generously to others in need. Put your hand to the plow, plow a straight row, do it as unto the Lord, and then give according to what there is in need. The body of Christ, this is a holy union of you here in this place. You represent the very body of Christ. It's the reason I'm telling you, I mean, these Wednesday nights as we go through these spiritual gifts, I'm I'm not begging you to come. I'm I'm telling you here that on these Wednesday nights as we talk about spiritual gifts, we're going to be talking about what your part is in the body of Christ. And let me tell you, every single one of you have a part. Jesus did not put you here. It says Christ built the church and he's building this church. He did not put you here to sit and soak. Well, I really enjoy your messages, Pastor. Well, good. Now let's put them to work. Amen. God has a place for you. I'm I'm thankful for those of you that stepped up to fill the role of cleaning this church on it. Well, is that part of the role of the body of Christ? You bet. You bet. And when John mows the yard, a part of the body of Christ, when these guys crawled into the church here, John and, and David O. this past yesterday, and ran some more wire to the back, as part of the body of Christ. When the bushes get trimmed, it's part of the body of Christ. When the, when the church gets painted, it's part of the body of Christ. People ride down the road and they look at that church and they say, look how good that church looks. That's representative of what they think about their Lord. That's part of the body of Christ. Who we are. Miss Mary made these banners some years ago. That's glorifying to God. It's part of the body of Christ. When these folks get up here and and sing the glory of the Lord, it's part of the body of Christ. We get together on Wednesday night and we pray for one another. It's part of the body of Christ. When I spoke to people in North Carolina this morning before I came here, we prayed for people back there that that I've been praying for for years, some of which have no relationship with Christ whatsoever. That's part of the body of Christ. Our prayer time together. Give generously to others. Quit stealing. Ultimately, it's selfishness. I want that. I can't, can't afford that, so I'll just take that. I can't afford it. I can't afford it. I certainly can't afford to steal it because of what it does to my relationship with you and relationship with God. 
I can't afford it. You understand what I'm saying? I simply can't afford it. It's rooted in selfishness and an improper desire. This is not the love of God. Put your hands to the plow and then do it so that you have the res- understand that you've got this responsibility. Galatians 6, 5, each one should bear his own load. Each one should bear his own load. Now let's look what else it says. Not working when you are able is stealing. It's stealing. 2 Thessalonians 3.10 Even while we were with you, we gave you this command. Those unwilling to work should not eat. 2 Thessalonians 3.11 Yet we hear that some of you are living idle lives, refusing to work and meddling in other people's business. What happens? What happens when we are not active doing something productive that ultimately results in our giving to the Lord? We end up meddling in other people's business. I, I've seen it over and over again. Verse 12, now such persons we command and exhort in the Lord Jesus Christ to work in quiet fashion and eat their own bread. According to the employee, this is an interesting study, guards mark. According to an employee screening company, guards mark, employee theft costs more than $120 billion a year in this country. It's more than shoplifting, more than organized crime, all of that from employees stealing from their employer. So don't tell me there's not a problem here. There's a basic problem. Here's what it says about the world. Based on a 5% average loss in 2009, the gross world product translates to a potential global loss of more than 2.9 trillion, with a T, dollars of employees stealing from their employers. $2.9 trillion. Our national debt is $8 trillion. Just theft, $2.9 trillion. And that was six years ago. Yeah. So, it is a problem. Retailers nationwide lose less to shoplifters and organized crime than they do this group. Then it says, you work hard and then give generously. So, which is it? Better to one another's, bear one another's burdens and therefore the law of Christ. Look, I've just said, bear your own burden. Now I'm telling you, bear one another's burdens. So, which is it? Both. Yes, yes, both. If all, think about this. If all of us were bearing our own burdens and then seeking to bear part of somebody else's burden, would, would it all work out? I think it all works out. That's the body of Christ. That ought to be the difference between the body of Christ and the world. That's what it ought to be like. Will a man rob God? This is, this is a quote from Malachi 3. Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me, he says. And it's normally thought of in terms of our financial giving. But I want you to hear from Greg Laurie this morning. I think an awful lot of Greg. I had a chance a time or two to meet him and, uh, and work with him on a re- revival that was taking place in North Carolina there. He says this, In each of our lives, the Lord has graciously instilled talents and gifts. Wednesday night, spiritual gifts. He says that God has invested into us talents, raw talents, talents that we have, things that we can do, but also spiritual gifts. For those of us that are saved, every single person that's been saved that has the Holy Spirit living inside of them was given at least one spiritual gift at the time of their salvation. Now, whether you are growing that or not is in your court. And that's part of what we're talking about on Wednesday nights. But he says, each one of our lives has been graciously instilled with these talents and gifts to neglect to use them for his glory rather than hoarding them for our own benefit is nothing short of stealing. That's Greg Laurie. I'm real glad I didn't say that because somebody would be mad with me. (laughs) But Greg said that. It's Greg. Verse 16. You must not testify falsely against your neighbor. This is lying. This is lying. We're going to spend the rest of our time this morning talking about this because it seems like the least of these problems, doesn't it? Adultery, stealing, lying. Let's talk about lying. 
because it's all rooted in the same basic problem. If you get this, the rest of it will or should come pretty naturally. What are the forms that we have of this? Lying, this ties back to both grammatically and contextually to the misuse of God's name. Remember when we talked about that, misusing God's name? King James says, using his name in vain. The misuse of his name, I swear by God that I will. And then we, we came to understand this, that if we represent ourselves as Christ followers, to promise somebody something, others are looking at that and saying, well, that's what a Christ follower does. We are using his name. So when you promise to do something, taking an oath that says, yes, I will do it, and not fulfill that promise is when you profess to be a Christ follower is a lie. Let's look at what Jesus says in Matthew 5, again from the Sermon on the Mount. Simply let your yes be yes, and your no, no. Let it be that solid. And then he tells us the downside of this. Listen, apart from this, anything other than this, anything different from this, is from the evil one. What's the big deal? It's just a little white lie. Anything apart from your yes being yes and your no being no is from the evil one, according to the scriptures. Now, why is lying such a big deal? We are, in essence, going back to that taking the God's name in vain, misusing God's name, misusing our relationship with God, misrepresenting him before a lost and a dying world. Let your yes be yes and your no, no. Anything else is from the evil one. Lying. Another form of that is what we do to get attention. You ever heard of anybody just spin a tail? The fish I caught was this big. <laughs> the only difference in the story between now and the time I was 12 years old when I caught my first fish was that my arms are wider now. <laughs> this big. Attention getting. We do it to get attention. Flattery is another form of lying. Now, let me, let me be clear. As the politicians say these days, let me be clear, perfectly clear. <laughs> I'm not talking about encouraging someone rightly. Flattery is building up somebody's ego that may not deserve that in order to get in the good graces of that person so that I might have a better relationship with them, so that I might have better opportunity down the road with that person. That's the difference. Encouragement, Elizabeth has a spiritual gift of encouragement. I can tell you that because I've already experienced that. Uh, it should never come as a form of flattery. It should always come as an encouragement toward what God's doing in us. Encourage one another in the Lord. Exaggeration, the fish story. Hypocrisy. You know, the, whole, the word hypocrisy comes from the actors on the stage of the day. They would take whatever emotion that they were trying to portray and they'd pick up that mask and put it over their face. And if it was sadness, there was a frown and there was tears. And if there was laughter, it was this big jovial laughter look on a person's face. Whatever mask they put over their face, that's what they were portraying. And it's this word hypocrisy comes from there. We are putting on a mask and not telling the truth. It's a lie. Selective telling. Oh, let me go on with this. This is a hot button for me. <laughs> put down my clicker. I've experienced this so much, believe it or not, within the seminary, within seminarians. They'll selectively tell a story, and I've had them do this, to selectively tell a story about me that leaves out crucial parts. And the selective telling makes me look really bad. It's not that they told a lie. They'll go, I didn't tell a lie. You're right, you didn't physically say words that were untrue. It's just that you left 
out the most important part. (laughs) And listen to me real carefully. This is important. You can use accurate, truthful words and still be portraying a lie. Selective telling. So it's one of my pet peeves. It just absolutely drives me crazy to hear people, well, I didn't lie. I didn't lie, Pastor. No, you just didn't tell the truth. (laughs) Selective telling. Silence. You're sitting in a group of guys or gals, and somebody brings up and tells a story about somebody else that's not there. And it's not a very attractive story, and, and you happen to know that it's not true. And you sit in silence instead of defending the character of that individual. That's a type of a lie. And this does not mean (laughs) that you must tell everything you know either. (laughs) You understand what I'm saying? There's great discernment and great wisdom in this. Great discernment and great wisdom. All of us, start with me, need to be praying for that kind of discernment and wisdom. As we deal with these kind of issues of life. Why is lying so incredibly hurtful? It is impossible for God to lie. And yet, here I am representing him standing here this morning. And you represent him when you walk out these doors. I mean, don't tell me people don't know. People know, Chris, that you represent Christ when you walk out this door. Is lying important? Is truth important? Let's turn to the other side of that. Let's look at truth. Christ says, John 14, 6, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. I am the truth. In his very character and nature, in his attributes, is truth. That relationship that we have with God must reflect truth. It's one of the great apologetic tools is to talk to people about truth. Now, why is that so difficult in our culture today? Well, because from the time that I was in elementary school, we began learning something about this relativistic truth. What is true for you may not be true for me. What's true for me may not be true for you. Hogwash. Absolute truth, all truth, here's a, here's a bold statement, think about this, all truth is absolute. But I'm cold and Ruthie's hot. 70 degrees in here, but it's still true, listen, it's still true, she's hot and I'm cold. It's still true. All truth is absolute. God will not be represented well by a lie. We cannot stand and say and properly represent God with a lie. And here's the danger of that. If there's any seminarians watching this, here's the danger of that. But pastor, I just see this easier course and when I get to the end of this course God's going to be glorified and it, all it takes is this one little lie at the front end of this and I can navigate this course more directly God's glorified more more quickly it's still a lie it does not represent him well God is the source of truth and is truth according to John 14, 6. It's in his very attributes, his nature. Satan is the father of lies, John 8, 44. Satan is the father of lies. Where does that lie come from that you say is going to glorify God in the end? It comes from the very evil one. Now, if lying, which looks like the least of all of our possible problems here this morning with regard to lying or stealing or adultery, if all of this is this important to God in our proper relationship with Him, what would you think about the other parts of that? Lying breaks down trust, which breaks down relationships. Listen, 
when those couple of students came and told these great tales about me and left out selectively the very heart of those issues and made me look diminished before a lost and a dying world as well as to other people professing to be Christians. All they're doing is tearing down their own relationship with God and with one another. Don't get involved in that kind, listen, of ministry. It's not ministry. It is not ministry. It's a lie. It breaks down and tears up relationships. I never looked at those guys the same. I never looked at them the same. I prayed for them. I tried to encourage them, but I never looked at them the same. Why? Because it tears down relationships. It destroys relationships. It happens in homes, husbands, wives, fathers, children, mothers, children, grandparents. It tears up relationships. It happens in the church. Why do more churches or more churches destroyed than any other reason? Right here. Relationships are torn apart by the lies that are told in congregations. You want to see a church torn apart? Start this gossip train that just tells just a little bit of a lie. Let me tell you about the gossip train. You already know the story. You get in a circle. You whisper a lie around the circle. You get around here by the time... You tell the story over here, and somebody was taking their dog outside. You get back over here, somebody's taking the dog and throwing them off a cliff. You know, it's, it happens. Extolling the truth while telling lies. Tell, talking about this wonderful Savior who is truth while telling lies to people. Psalm 101, verse 7. He who works deceit shall not dwell within my house. He who tells lies shall not continue in my presence, saith the Lord. Ephesians 4.25, Therefore, laying aside falsehood, speaking truth, each one of you to his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Both my wife and I have had some physical challenges this last week. And she made the comment last night, says, this is the perfect picture of the body of Christ. I'm suffering in this one place that does not seem very important, and yet my whole body is suffering. My whole body is in torment, but really the pain's in one place. I've got this little pain in my left heel, and these shoes don't help it any. And, and, and yet my whole body is stressed over this tiny little place. That doesn't seem very important. And that's what happens in the body of Christ. We're stressed, we're distressed, we're, we're torn apart from something as simple as this. Watchman Nee. I'm going to wind up with a couple of quotes from Watchman Nee this morning. I've quoted Watchman Nee before, and I, I, I love some of the things. This is, uh, he's got a book called The Normal Christian Life. This one's called The Normal Christian Worker. Very good little book. And he says this. It not infrequently happens that a worker modifies the truth because he is influenced by men or by circumstances or by his own desires. The truth demands undeviating loyalty to all people concerned, not to one over the other. We are possessed. We can sacrifice if need be, but the truth we dare not sacrifice. We dare not put truth up on the auction block. It is not available. It is not negotiable. It's not negotiable. We must never seek to bend it to our purpose, but must always bow to it. Because why? Because Christ, He says, is the truth. Those who speak to bend the truth, seek to bend the truth to their own purposes. Here's what happens: First Timothy three eight. In the first letter to Timothy, Paul refers to this type of person as double-tongued. Double-tongued, speaking out of both sides of their mouth. Forked tongue. That's what Native Americans used to say, speak with forked tongue. 
The trouble with many people is that they never learn to simply say yes when the facts in the case demand a yes and to say no when they, say, when they know that that is the truth. No. Their speech is never simple and straightforward but is carefully studied and their statements are always suited to their own interest. All utterance that are made with intent to deceive come from the category of lying if you are asked a question and do not wish to answer it or are unable to answer it, you can politely refuse to reply. How hard a lesson is this to learn? I don't know. Sometimes some of you ask me things that you think I ought to know, and I go, I don't know. Or you ask me something regarding the situation or whatever's going on in the church, and I say, I'm not going to answer that right now. Maybe I can give you an answer later, but I'm not going to answer that now. Some of you know, even since I've been here, I've had to give those kind of answers. It's much better to do that than to tell a lie. Just say you don't know or you're not willing to talk about that right now. It's, it's, it's not that hard. We want people to believe the truth, not a lie. We dare not, therefore, use what are in themselves true words in order to convey a false impression. That's what I was talking about earlier. Using true words to project or portray a false impression. And he says, if the fact is yes, then just learn to say yes. If it's no, we must learn to say no. What is more than that is of the evil one? Of course, he's quoting Jesus there. Most of all, we must be careful in bending the truth in an effort to elevate ourselves. Here's what happens. We start telling the story and it just, you know, our imagination runs away with us. And your imagination is given to you by God. It's a gift of God. And to use it wrongly is a misuse. It is a mistrust of God. But to tell the story, just tell it accurately. But here's what happens. In an effort to make myself look good, I tell the story over here. I mean, we, we accuse politicians of this. You know, they're in this group and they tell this story. And then they're in this group over here and they tell a totally different story. And the two of them don't seem to go together. And then the news gets a hold of it and puts, it all, puts one up back to back on the news so you can hear them say one thing and hear the other side of their mouth something else. That's forked tongue. Just let your yes be yes and your no, no. And to him will come the glory from that. This is the bottom line. All of this is rooted in a love, a misunderstanding and a misappropriation of love. It is rooted in selfishness, not in the truth. It is rooted in selfishness, not in Him. And if our lives, if our lives are genuinely going to be for the glory of God, these issues of adultery and stealing and lying become very important because we are either in a relationship with God that is appropriate and right or we are not. And here's what my desire, as, as your pastor, here's my desire for you. My desire for you is that you personally, Sherry, Mary, John, you guys personally, every one of you, personally will have a relationship with God that is pure and holy and right. And that relationship will bring you great joy. That there would be a glory to God given out of your life. That you'll, you'll portray that before a world with such accuracy, such intense, that will bear intense scrutiny. Because as peop the more people investigate what's going on with you, the more he is glorified. That there's no skeleton left in the closet. That we live our lives in such a way that God is so glorified through them that when we come into that throne room, and you do every time you pray, when we come into that throne room and we bow down, that our heads hit the floor before a holy God with such joy and such comfort 
And such power is generated from that because of a, of a relationship with him that's proper. And when that gets right, here's what I'm going to promise you. If everyone in here, including myself, will work on that relationship being right between myself and God and these guidelines he's laid out for us, if we, if we are working on that, every one of these other relationships that's working horizontally here will get right. I promise you. And when this is right, let me tell you what happens. If everybody in here, let me, let me just speak to you carefully here. If everybody in here, every single one of us, would do that one thing, work on this, it not only is going to change this church, it's going to change this entire community, it'll change this entire state, just with what's here today. Now, you may not believe that, but I, I, I know that. I know that to be true. This is right. Every one of us commit ourselves, this is right, going to be right. Then all of this will be made right. And I can come to you and say, you know, I said this and I, I sense that this hurts you in some way. And I'm deeply sorry. And forgiveness is had. Relationships are built. Time that, that is taken to heal wounds draws very short. Why? Because people will genuinely see in you and I a desire to bring Him glory through lives that are less imperfect, but which are designed and we are giving over to Him to honor Him and glorify Him. Now that is a big job. And here's, here's the problem with all of this. There's a problem. As much as I desire that, I can't do it. I can't do it. Only you can do it. Each one of you. Only you can do it. And when we do, this place will be a different place. There, let me tell you what happens when that happens. People will be begging to come in the door. They'll be begging to be around you and hear the truth of the gospel. They'll be pleading for, for a, a glimpse of heaven that's that beautiful. True revival is pictured in what I've just given you. Now, here, here's, here's what I'm going to tell you. Listen. About once a month, we're going to take a Wednesday night and just devote totally to prayer. Every true revival that has ever been in this world began with a few people coming together, genuinely desiring to see that happen and praying. And if you and I will do that and commit ourselves to that, this will be a different place. We will see a different reflection of one another, and God will be glorified in that. I promise you. Amen? Let's pray. Father.